Okay, so today we're going to be looking at chapter 17, which deals with activity-based costing. So here with this chapter, we're going to be looking at another way to assign these indirect costs, those overhead items that we've been looking at primarily this semester. So in this chapter, we're going to look primarily at three different methods for doing this. So one of those methods is what is called the plant-wide overhead rate method. One of those methods is the departmental overhead rate method. And then of course, the last method is what's actually the title of this chapter, which is activity-based costing. So what we need to realize is essentially in this chapter, we need to be able to distinguish between each type and see how they're similar and how they're different. So essentially what we're trying to do here is the same thing that we've been doing since the beginning of the semester, which is really focused in on those indirect costs, those overhead items. So we see this general depiction of how we assign costs, and this is pretty much what we've seen up until this point. We've seen that direct materials and labor go essentially directly into that goods in process or that work in process account from the very beginning. We then see that those indirect materials and indirect labor items first feed into factory overhead, and that is then allocated across to goods in process or work in process inventory. After that point, once we have finally finished the production of our goods that were in process, they will, of course, be moved while remaining on the balance sheet, of course, still to another account called finished goods inventory. Then once we sell the item, it'll actually come off the balance sheet, moving over to the income statement through that cost of goods sold account. So no, nothing too new at this point. Now, what we're going to be looking at in this chapter, though, is a go-kart company. And in this case, at the beginning of the chapter, we are told that the go-kart company has a tremendous amount of orders for their custom go-kart and very few orders for their standard go-kart. And because of this high demand for the custom go-kart, the company is strongly considering eliminating the standard go-kart in favor of only producing the custom go-kart. Now, this sounds fantastic, right? If you look at this in a simplistic view and you say, well, that makes sense. They've got strong demand for one product. Why don't they lean into that product and actually make sure all of their sales are able to come through on that product? And that, that seems reasonable. But the one thing we need to be careful of is, are we actually making money on these custom go-karts? And the way we know that is by seeing if we have allocated our costs appropriately. So what we're going to have to do is come in and actually look at that and see what we find out from these three methods. Now, the first, of course, is the plant-wide overhead rate method. This is simply one overhead rate used to assign overhead across the entirety of the production process. So this sounds nice and simple, and it is, but I think we'll see there are some major drawbacks to this, um, not the least of which is that because this is based on all sorts of volume metrics, a unit that gets produced in large quantity will typically be assigned more cost than a more specialized unit that gets produced in smaller quantities. And this may be okay, but it may not always work out how we really intend to. So we'll see that in just a minute. Now the departmental rate is an improvement upon the plant-wide overhead rate method. The only real downside to it though, is that it still is that volume-based metric. So at least until we get into a little bit more depth here, we just need to realize at this point that these two methods, the plant-wide and the departmental rate method, both are based on volume-based metrics and as such can lead to some making some unintended decisions. Now, the good thing about departmental rate versus plant-wide is, of course, that you will have more than one rate. So you'll actually break out your overhead allocation by department. So maybe you have a shipping department and an assembly department. They'll each get their own cost driver and you can assign or you can allocate that overhead based on those more specific cost drivers. This is certainly an improvement on plant-wide, but it's still not the best we can do. So the last method that we'll look at here in chapter 17 is what is called ABC or activity-based costing. So for the rest of the semester, when I want you to think back to chapter 17, I'll very likely say, remember when in ABC we did blank, right? That will be this activity-based costing. So when you hear ABC, think activity-based costing. Now, the good news here 
is that we will have at least two overhead drivers like we saw with the departmental rate method, but typically you'll get many rates. So in practice, you could have say 50, 100 activity rates. You could have more, right? It just depends on how much overhead you've got, how many activities are involved in this production process, how accurately you want to assign the cost. Now in here, I probably won't ever give you more than maybe five or six different activities. And that's enough for us to see how this works. But in practice, you will likely see far more than that because companies will want to get an accurate cost allocation. Now, the problem is to get this data, to get this information in practice requires significantly more time and effort than we're going to see in this class. So do keep that in mind. The good news is though, if you're making a really important decision, if you first do this activity-based costing method, you will have better information on which to base that decision. So we'll go ahead and look at each method in turn, starting with the simplest, which is just the plant-wide overhead rate method. So as you see here in our illustration, our entirety of our overhead cost is all in one indirect cost pool up top. It comes down through one cost allocation base and is then allocated to the products based on usage. Okay, so this is pretty much what we've seen so far. It's pretty simple. So let's see how this works. In this case, we're looking at cart company. They've got two types of go-karts, standard and custom. The standard go-kart, they produce 5,000 units and each one takes 15 direct labor hours for a total of 75,000 direct labor hours. While the custom go-kart, we produce 1,000 units at 25 hours per unit for a total of 25,000 direct labor hours. In total, this gives us 100,000 hours of direct labor. And we see our overhead costs are broken out into two groups but under the plant-wide overhead rate method, I have to use only one cost driver. So even though I'm using things like indirect labor and utilities, right, we may not be getting a really accurate cost allocation for that full amount because we're only basing it on direct labor hours. So we'll look at this 4.8 million divided by our 100,000 hours, and that gives us a rate of $48 per hour. So at this point, we will see that for each go-kart, we are allocating $48 times their amount of direct labor. So for the standard go-kart is $720, and for the custom go-kart it is $1,200. So at this point in time, if I was to say, looking at our, our total product cost per unit down at the bottom, well, if I wanted to sell a custom go-kart for, say, $2,500, would that be a good price? And the answer appears to be yes. And that's because at this point, we've got our direct materials, labor, and overhead, coming out to 2,300, if I sell at 2,500, I'm at least making something. Okay, granted, it's not an earth shattering profit on each sale, but it is still profit. So we are still doing okay with this. Now, the big question then is, well, is that cost, is that total cost of 2,300, say for the custom go-kart going to be the accurate total cost? And I think what we'll see as we go down the list through this chapter, is that that is not in fact the correct cost because what we will see is there are some costs that should only be getting applied to that custom go-kart but under these volume-based metrics with the plant-wide and departmental rate method those costs will be shared primarily to the standard go-kart resulting in our cost allocation being much higher for the standard go-kart than it should be now if this is the case, and in fact, I'm assigning too much cost to the standard and too little cost to the custom, I think this might explain what I'm seeing in terms of my demand for my products. So what we said earlier was that my standard go-kart had very low demand. And the reason for that could be that I'm assigning so much cost to it that when I'm trying to make a sale, my sales price is much, much higher than it really should be for that type of product because the market is intelligent and our customers can figure out if they're getting ripped off or not, right? They look at this and say, well, I can get an identical go-kart or one very similar at this other company for a significantly lower price. Why would I buy yours? And it's a good question, why would they? So that could be what's happening here. Now, on the other hand, we may have so many orders for our custom go-karts, which is what we saw with that high, high demand because I'm not assigning enough cost. And because I'm not assigning enough cost, when my price should be higher, I'm actually charging a much lower price. So because of that much lower price, the quantity demanded of my custom go-kart is much higher than it really should be. 
And so what may be happening is I'm actually losing a ton of sales on my standard because my price is too high. And I'm actually losing money on each sale for my custom go-kart because my price is too low. And so I think we'll see this play out as we continue on. But let's move on to our next method. So for our next method, we see the departmental overhead rate method. We have department A and department B. So we'll take our total overhead cost, assign it out in a piece to department A, a piece to department B. At that point, we'll use their each individual cost driver. So department A will have a cost driver, department B will have a cost driver. That will help us figure out our department A overhead rate and our department B overhead rate. At that point, we'll look at how much of department A was used for product one, and we'll assign that overhead based on usage to product one. We'll do the same things for products two and three. We'll then come back, calculate our department B overhead rate, look at usage by product one, and allocate costs accordingly across the three products. So in this case, we're told we have two departments. We have the machining department and the assembly department. So as you might expect, the machining department primarily is based on that overhead is going to be based on machine hours. While the assembly department's overhead will be based on direct labor hours. So what we're seeing then is with that machining department, every time I use an hour on that machine, I should be incurring some amount of overhead. And every time I use a direct labor hour in assembly, I will be incurring some amount of overhead. So if we look at our chart then, what we'll see is we'll come in, we'll see that we had 5,000 units times 10 hours per unit for a total of 50,000 machine hours, four hour standard go-kart. Then we take our 5,000 units times our five direct labor hours per unit in assembly, and we come out to 25,000 direct labor hours for our standard go-kart. Now we'll come in, we will look, and we will see that we had 1,000 units of that custom go-kart times 20 machine hours per unit for 20,000. And 1,000 units, once again, times the five direct labor hours for 5,000 direct labor hours. Now, in total, of course, what we're seeing is that we had 50,000 plus 20,000, which is 70,000 total machine hours, and 25,000 plus 5,000, which is 30,000 direct labor hours. So we can see very clearly what is happening here. So we will go ahead and continue on to our next slide where we actually see all of the numbers start to tie together. So on our next slide, we'll take our machining department overhead rate of 4.2 million divided by those 70,000 machine hours. Gives us a rate of $60 per machine hour. And we'll do the same thing for the assembly department. Now, once again, we'll look at how this all is coming together. So very first, we have our machining department for our standard go-kart. So this table set up a little bit different. We've got our standard go-kart in this column and we've got our custom go-kart over here. So don't get confused when you look at this. This one's twisted um, compared to the other one. But we've got our machining department here. $60 per machine hour times 10 machine hours per unit gives us an allocated cost of 600. In that assembly department, we had $20 per machine, or sorry, per direct labor hour times five direct labor hours for $100. Of course, 600 plus 100 is $700, which we see here. Now we'll do a similar type of calculation over here for our custom go-kart. We have our $60 per machine hour times our 20 machine hours per unit gives us $1,200. And $20, $20 per direct labor hour times five direct labor hours per unit gives us a cost of 100, giving us then a total cost assigned here of $1,300. So very similar to what we saw a minute ago, but this is the way this all ties together. Now, we're already moving in the direction that we referenced before and that we're seeing even with just this simple split into two areas, we're already assigning less cost to the standard and more cost to the custom. Now, at this point, the shift isn't that dramatic. It is certainly a difference. It is certainly a better cost allocation. But at this point, this isn't perhaps a difference that would drive my company to bankruptcy very, very quickly. But we may be still misallocating by a tremendous amount. So before we continue, though, we need to look at just some advantages and disadvantages of the two methods we've covered so far. So the biggest advantage with the plant-wide overhead rate method is that it is easily 
able to be implemented, easily able to use, and it is consistent with US GAAP, which means you only need one set of financial statements. You don't need to figure out, well, what do I use for my internal reporting? What do I report externally? You don't have to deal with any type of adjustment between rules or anything. It's very simple to implement, very simple to use. Now, the disadvantage is, of course, that if you are producing a lot of products, it may not be reasonable to assume that they use overhead in the same capacity, right? They may not use overhead in the same proportion. So might not necessarily be a good allocation of cost. It is an easy allocation, but that doesn't mean it's good. Now, the other item here is that our overhead costs may not, in fact, bear a direct relationship with the one cost driver we're using. So if I'm allocating the machine department's overhead and I'm using direct labor hours, that doesn't really make sense. But if I'm only using one overhead rate, I'll have some mismatches like that inherently. And that leads to this massive misallocation of costs that we're about to see. Now, the other item that we see is our departmental overhead rate method, which we just talked about. It, of course, gives us more accurate cost allocation than the plant-wide overhead method. And it is more refined, which is, of course, why it gives us that more accurate cost allocation. But disadvantages, of course, we're assuming that products, of course, are similar in volume, complexity, amount of units produced per batch. We're assuming that departmental overhead costs, of course, are proportional to the allocation base. And just as we will see with all of these methods, there will likely be some amount of a distortion to the overall amount of product cost. Now, our last type here is the activity-based costing method. And you'll notice here, we start with our overhead costs still in one big group, but very quickly, we have to split that out. So what we see then is right away, we're splitting out into three different categories. In this case, department X, or I'm sorry, activity cost pool X, activity cost pool Y, activity cost pool Z. So you've got three different activity cost pools. And we'll see that each one of those will be allocated a piece of the overall overhead cost. They'll then each have their own individual cost driver. We'll then calculate an activity overhead rate for each activity. Then we will apply, of course, based on actual usage. So whatever this overhead rate is, we'll apply based on how much of that activity product one used. Then however much of that activity product two used and however much of that activity product three used. And then we'll, of course, come back, do the same thing for activity cost pool Y, run through all three products, and do the same thing for activity cost pool Z. Now, in order to do this, though, it is a little bit more involved than what we've seen. So we actually said there's a four-step process here. The first is we have to identify the actual activities. If I don't know what the activities are, how on earth can I do activity-based costing? It just doesn't make sense. So we have to start with the identification of that activity and figure out the cost that they actually cause. Now, the second item here is to trace those overhead costs into what are called cost pools. So we'll see that in just a minute. We will then use that information to help me determine activity rates. And finally, with the determination of those activity rates, we will actually assign overhead costs to the cost objects, to those products themselves. So in this case, we have six different items. So we'll look at those. We see machine setup, repair, factory maintenance, and engineer salaries are all types of labor. They are, of course, indirect or they wouldn't be getting allocated. Right? If they were direct, they would simply go wherever they needed to go. But because they are indirect, they are part of overhead, they must be allocated. So that totals out to $4 million. And we see our last two items, assembly line, power, heating, and lighting, 600 and 200 for a total of $800,000. So what we've got to do now is figure out, well, I think there's some similarities with some of these, and some of these are kind of off on their own. So some of these we can group up, some of these we can leave alone. So in the end, what I'm looking for here are four different activity cost pools. So we have one for craftsmanship, we have one for setup, one for design modification, and one for overall plant services. So what we see is that the craftsmanship activity cost pool is just made up of that assembly line power, a $600,000. Now the setup piece we see is being grouped between the machine setup and repair for a total of $2 million. Design modification deals with our engineer salaries, so the people actually designing the product and making improvements to the overall design for, for 1.2 million. And of course, our plant services, things like factory maintenance, heating and lighting for a million dollars. So each one of those 
will need its own individual cost driver. The, uh, the determination of an accurate cost driver here is just as important as the determination of an accurate activity. Because if either one of those pieces are inaccurate, the activity rate you get will be useless. So we have to make sure we find things that actually deal with that area and that actually do incur that cost. So here when we're talking about the craftsmanship activity pool, we're going to be basing that on direct labor hours, which makes sense. So we're gonna take my $600,000 over my, in this case, I believe it was 30,000 direct labor hours, not 300, it is a typo on the slide. I do apologize for that. And that will come out to a rate of $20 per direct labor hour. So we see that coming through here. So craftsmanship, direct labor hours is our activity driver or our cost driver. 600 over 30 is 20. We'll then follow the same type of logic all the way down the list. So with setup, we do setup once per batch. The design modification, we incur cost based on the cost of each design or based on each design change. And with plant services, we're going to allocate this on the basis of square feet. So we have all of our activity rates calculated. At this point, we've done with all of our, we are done with all of our steps, except for the last piece, which is to actually assign those overhead costs through to the individual cost objects or those products. So let's see how this works. In this case, we had activities consumed times the activity rate. We had 25,000 direct labor hours for their standard go-karts times $20 per direct labor hour gives us the total cost of $500,000. So I'm going to take just a minute to zoom in a little bit and really talk about what's happening here. So let me grab the pen real quick and we'll, we'll look at this a little bit more um, detailed. So here we go. We've got our craftsmanship. We see that is $600,000. I'm sorry, let me change that color. Um, so it shows up a little bit better here. So let's see. So we've got our craftsmanship department. They have a total here of 600,000, 2 million for setup, 1.2 for design modification and 1 million for plant services. If you actually add all of those up, you'll come out then, of course, to a total of $4,800,000. So we see that um, as you just add those four numbers together. 600 plus 2 is 2.6, plus 1.2 is 3.8, plus 1 is 4.8 million. Now, of course, that is the total overhead allocation that we are trying to deal with. Now, with each of these, we will come in. We will need to actually figure out a activity rate. So let's get this. So for each one, we have calculated our activity rate, in this case, $20 per direct labor hour, 10,000 per batch, 120 per design, and $50 per square foot. At this point, we'll simply look and see, well, how much of each activity was needed by each product. So when we look at our direct labor for that craftsmanship area, we'll see that we had 25,000 direct labor hours for standard go-karts times that rate of $20 gives me a total of 500,000. And 5,000 times 20, of course, will give me a total cost of 100,000. And you say, well, flag on the play, isn't the whole point of this, we're supposed to be allocating more costs to the custom go-kart and we're actually allocating less. And I say, you're right. But let's look a little bit further down the list. So as we come down the list, what we will see is that as we move, sure enough, less and less cost is actually being allocated to the standard. And that is because we need less batches for the standard. We can probably produce more units in each batch. So we need less batch changes. Whereas with the custom, we need more batch changes. This results in a significantly larger amount of cost being allocated to custom than to standard. We then come in and we look at our design modification. And this is the big one, okay? This is the one that really changes. And the reason this one changes so much is because only the custom go-kart requires any design modification. So you'll notice that full cost, that full 1.2 million is being allocated only to the custom go-kart. Now, under our previous methodologies, that single plant-wide overhead rate method or the departmental rate method, the brunt or the bulk of this design modification cost and, and for that matter, the setup cost was being allocated over to the standard. But as you see here, that wasn't an accurate cost allocation. So what we should have been seeing was a tremendous shift of this cost over to those custom go-karts. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, at the end of this, the plant services piece, right? 
what we saw was $50 per square foot. And it does in fact end up that more of that cost gets allocated to the standard. And that makes sense because what we're saying here is we produce in this case, five times more uh, standard go-karts than custom, it probably makes sense that that takes up a little bit more space than the custom go-karts. So on that note, the standard does actually bear a little bit more of the overall cost. But now what you'll notice is that we have in fact allocated the entire $4.8 million, $1.5 million to the standard and $3.3 million to the custom. Now, on top of that, which you can also see is that if we add across, so we have our 500,000 here, our 100,000 here, that is my 600,000 in total craftsmanship cost. So we are allocating the full amount between these two areas and between all four different activities. So it works out really nicely. So in this case, when we continue on, what we'll actually see is that the total cost assigned to each unit is now dramatically different than where we began. So if we look at where we began, under the plant-wide method, we had a total cost assigned for overhead to those standard go-karts of over $700. But with this more accurate cost allocation, we can see we should have only assigned a total of $300. So the fact that my cost allocation was off by more than double do you think that could have impacted my pricing and sales decisions? I think it would have, because I think I would have been trying to recoup that additional $420 on a go-kart that wasn't incurring that much cost. And that means on my custom go-kart, you'll notice, we had only been trying to recover $1,200 of overhead, when truly I should have been trying to recover more than $3,000 in overhead. So what that tells me is when I was making my product pricing and sales decisions, it's very likely anything I was selling as a custom go-kart, I was selling at a tremendous loss because I was not trying to recover that full $2,000 extra or more than $2,000 truthfully an extra overhead cost. So this explains why I had so many orders for my custom go-karts because my price was simply way too low. And so few orders for my standard go-kart because my price was way too high. So had I not done this, it's very likely that my company would have eliminated all of the necessary equipment to produce the standard go-kart in favor of producing only custom go-karts. And by the time I would have realized what had happened, it may have been too late. Because by the time I realized that my actual overhead for these custom go-karts is over $3,000, now I have to raise my price. And when I raise my price, all those orders I had for custom go-karts are going to quit coming in because people are going to say, oh, it's no better of a deal here than anywhere else. So these product pricing decisions are so important because it dramatically impacts how we actually make our sales. Now, a couple of good things here about ABC. The first and in fact most obvious is that it is a more accurate cost allocation. And we've seen that now, right? It is a dramatically more accurate cost allocation. And because of that, it allows us to more accurately control overhead costs. It allows me to make better production and pricing decisions. It allows me to, in fact, allocate things like selling and administrative expenses that uh, are costs that were expensed by US GAAP. It allows me to determine the profitability by market segments. And I can even see things like cost of quality, which we'll talk about toward the tail end of the chapter. So with all of those advantages, you must be asking, well, there's got to be something wrong with it, right? There's no method that is absolutely perfect or it would be the only method anyone would ever use. And you're right. There are some significant disadvantages to activity-based costing. So of those, the first is the tremendous cost, right? And here we say, oh, well, there's four activities. Here are the cost drivers. Here's the total cost. And we make it look like it's something that can be done in just a couple of minutes. In truth, if you've got a large manufacturing facility, there may be hundreds, if not thousands of activities occurring every day in that production process. And so depending on the level of detail you want, it could take you a tremendous amount of time, not only to identify all of the individual activities, but to identify accurate cost drivers for each. Then you've got to determine, well, how much overhead should be assigned to that cost pool? Because if I assign too much overhead to that cost pool or not enough, then even if my cost driver is right, my allocation rate is wrong. And so it turns into this really finite, really detailed 
analysis that has to happen for this to actually be useful. It's incredibly expensive to do. Now, even with this, there's no way you're going to correctly identify every single activity and every single dollar and every single cost driver. There's no way it can be done with absolute precision. So even with all of this work, there will still be some cost distortion at the end. And because of that uncertainty or because of that cost distortion, you still can't be absolutely perfectly sure of any decision you're making. In a business, there's always going to be some amount of uncertainty, some degree that we're not quite sure about. Now, the biggest drawback, though, with activity-based costing and why a lot of companies won't use it, even though it does give them so much better information, is that activity-based costing is not, is not acceptable under US GAAP. Now, could we get into the why? Could we get into all the rules? Sure. But here's the deal. This is an intro level course. I will leave the why ABC is not acceptable under US GAAP to the next cost accounting course, which is actually called cost accounting. When you get in there, I'm sure you will discuss at length why activity-based costing is not acceptable under US GAAP. But in an intro course, all I need you to understand is that it is not acceptable under US GAAP. If you got that, that's all I need for you to know when it comes to GAAP and ABC. If you understand that, you can get any question right on the test I give you in regard to this. I'm not going to ask you the why in an intro class, right? When we move into the next area, when we move into cost accounting after you complete this course, sure, that may be a discussion to be had. But in here, all you need to know, ABC, not acceptable under US GAAP. By far the biggest weakness of this method. Now, we're talking about activities, but activities come in many different types. So we have four different types of activities. We have what's called a unit level, a batch level, a product level, and a facility level. So we're gonna run through these fairly quickly and then we'll spend a little bit of time on the table that comes up in about four or five slides. So here we've got our first level of activity. It's a unit level activity. This is something that has to be done to every single unit. Okay, if it is not there for that unit, you do not end up with a unit of product. Okay, so this could be anything like sewing on buttons to a sweater. This could be actually providing the electricity for the machinery um, to actually produce each unit of the product. This could be someone actually installing the tire on the car. But if this item is not done, you do not have a product, right? So that is a unit level activity. A batch level activity tends to be things like machine setup. Like I'm going to adjust the calibration for this machine to produce this type of product. And until I have to do another batch and change that, I'm good. I only have to do it once, right? But then when I want to produce a different product, I'll come in, I'll recalibrate the machine, and that'll allow me to produce the next batch. Now, product level, this is more like engineering type stuff. Like, this is where our engineers come in and they actually decide, okay, we can actually improve the product by doing X, Y, and Z. So once I've made that product improvement or that product enhancement, it doesn't have to happen again until I decide to make another improvement. So that product level cost is a little bit higher up the chain than our unit and our batch level. And of course, our facility sustaining level costs, these are even further out than the product level cost. They are not directly tied to any unit batch or product level decisions. So the textbook gives us this really good chart. When it comes to this chart, I think you need to spend some time looking at it, that is true. I do not think you need to memorize it, right? I'm not going to ask you to come in and recreate this chart on the test. I'm not going to do that, okay? I might give you a few of these things. I might ask you, well, what type of activity level does this occur at? Or what might be a good cost driver, or activity driver for this? But I'm not going to have you recreate this whole thing. It's simply too long, too many things. But if you are at least a little bit familiar with the logic of each one of these, I think you'll be fine. So we went through some examples on the first three. The last one I left off because I really just wanted to talk about these. Um, so we're talking about facility sustaining. Is anything that we said not related to unit batch or product level? This could be anything like cleaning. So the larger the area that needs to be cleaned, typically the more time that it will take the more effort that will be required, the more overhead that will be incurred. 
So we could see that coming in here. We could see anything like providing electricity. So this would be typically based on something like kilowatt hours. We could see providing personnel support. So the more employees I have, the more work HR has to do, for example. We could look at things like reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this could be based on the tons of CO2 that are actually emitted or recaptured or anything along those lines. So certainly we see different cost drivers, different activity drivers for each of these as we go down the list. As I said, read through it, maybe glance at it once or twice a day um, or once or twice a week before your test from now, and you'll probably be fine, right? I wouldn't spend a tremendous amount of time on this, um, but you certainly want to familiarize yourself with it, where if I tell you all of the following are unit level activities except, right, and I give you, say, a facility level, you can pick out the one that wasn't. Or if I said all of the following are batch level activities, you could pick out the one that was actually a unit level activity, right? And so you want to be able to have at least a working understanding of how these things tie together, but it's certainly not um, worth trying to memorize each and every one of those things on that list because I could very easily give you something that's not on that list. And so if all you've done is memorize a list, I don't think you're understanding enough to be ready for the test. But if you understand why those things are where they are, it'll help you identify something that I give you that may be different from that. So next we see our activity levels, a little bit more detail. And this is where we actually see that what we did earlier was actually one activity level for each one of these. So our unit level activities, this is where we were talking about craftsmanship in our example earlier. So the machining department, of course, will need the electricity to power the machines to produce each product. And so the more products I need to produce, the more cost I will incur. Right? So that is an, a good cost driver because as I do this more, my cost will go up. That makes sense. Now my batch level activity, these are performed only on each batch or group of units. So this is machine setup, right? This is order processing. So if you order 100 units, but it's on one order slip or one order form, then I've only got to process that one time. So that's what we see here. Now, with product level activities, this is where our engineers came in, and they actually had to decide, well, how do we actually improve the product? But once we've made that improvement, I don't have to decide that again. I can just use that same improved methodology or that same improved product uh, blueprint going forward. And finally, facility sustaining. This is going to be the costs that, of course, are not caused by any one product specifically. So for example, this could be things like rent and factory maintenance, um, because no matter what product is being produced and what batch size or what design modification, I still have to pay my rent. I still have to have maintenance performed. So these don't really care as much about output quantity, number of batches, anything like that. They're more of a facility wide. So it's more of that overview of what's actually happening. So that's what we see here. Now, when it comes to cost of quality, I pretty much say it this way. You can choose when you pay, okay? You really can. You can choose to pay now or you can choose to pay later, but I will tell you, you are far better off choosing to pay now because here's the way this works. You have what are called costs of good quality and you have costs of bad quality or costs of poor quality. You need to be aware of which costs are in which category you need to be aware of kind of why they are in that category. So we have costs of good quality, and these are prevention and appraisal activities. So I'll give you an example that is accounting related. So let's say this, you graduate from college, you come out, you got your master's degree in accounting, and you go to work in public accounting in a tax office, okay? So you go to work preparing tax returns for for people, for companies, for whoever needs you to prepare a tax return for them. But I'm going to tell you, when you first graduate college, you first step foot in the workplace, you don't know anything in the world there is to know about tax. Okay, you come out feeling like you know everything in the world, but when you start, you don't know anything. Not functionally, right? There's too much out there for us to teach you in college, right? We will teach you a lot. We will teach you the fundamentals, but day one, you're probably going to get hit, hit with something industry specific, some niche item that we can't cover. So you're going to have to be able to learn on your feet. You're going to have to be able to adapt and figure these things out. So the way that this works is when you first come into the company, hopefully there will be some type of training procedure. 
practice tax returns, they'll have you do. Practice um, training manuals, they'll have you complete. Some training video on how the software works, whatever it is. But there should be some type of hands-on training that puts you in the material, that puts you in the area that you're working on so that you get some exposure on something that isn't a live fire return right off the bat. Right? You need some type of training to make sure that when you do get your hands on a real return, you're being successful and you're being efficient. Because the truth is, when you first come out of college, your time isn't worth very much to your company. Not yet, right? So if they spend a week, two, even maybe three weeks or a month really training you up well, they haven't really lost that much production because truthfully, you aren't going to be very efficient anyway. So they're taking this time to train you. If they do that well, then what should happen is whenever you prepare your first set of returns, when you send those on through to the review process to your senior or to your manager, there should be very little review that has to actually happen. They'll look at your return and they'll go, hey, looks like you did pretty good, right? There's one or two things that probably need to be fixed, but overall, great work, right? So that saves them time from having to go back and forth with you on a list of 100 things that got messed up. And it saves you time from having to try to figure out what all the review notes mean. Because you learned it right the first time, you did it right the first time. Very good. So we've got prevention down. It's all that training stuff is prevention. Now appraisal. We come in with appraisal and this is that management review process. So this is when the staff, right, you come out of college, you come in, you are a staff. You prepare the tax return, you look at it, it looks fantastic to you, you send it on. This appraisal is when your senior or your manager looks at it, right? If they catch whatever is wrong, it'll come back to you. Sure, it's a little bit more expensive than you getting it right the first time because their time is more valuable. Right? They are more efficient. So anytime they are spending fixing mistakes you've made, it's time they can't spend fixing other mistakes other people have made or doing their own work. And so we need this appraisal activity and we need it to work well. But hopefully we've done enough training up in prevention that very little must be done in appraisal. So let's imagine though, we come in, we think Right, the staff prepares the return, looks good to the staff. They send it up to the senior. Senior looks at it, senior says, good to go. Goes up to the manager. Manager looks at it, says, it looks fantastic, sends it to the partner. Partner looks at the return and says, what on earth have you all been doing? This return is atrocious. All right, there are so many mistakes here. What were you looking at? So this is a cost of poor quality. This is an internal failure cost. So an internal failure cost occurs when we believe the product is complete, in this case, the tax return. We say, we think it's good, everything tied down, it looks right, everything's rolled forward properly from the previous year, all of our schedules are right, or we so thought, and the partner looks at it and goes, no, 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 all of it is wrong, go back and redo it. Well, at this point, right, the cost is pretty high because the staff has already worked on it, the seniors already worked on it, the managers approved it. So we've had a lot of people touch this return, put in a lot of time, and now we're told it's wrong, right? So at this point, a lot of cost is already put in, and now we've got to go back and redo a bunch of it. So this is an internal failure. Truthfully, this is the highest level of cost you ever want to incur. Okay, truthfully, some amount of appraisal cost, some amount of prevention is, this is certainly to be expected. Internal failure, we will see but hopefully we don't ever see anything past that. Okay, if we hit internal failure, at least it didn't leave the business, right? No permanent damage is done because we can still fix it before the product leaves. Now, external failure occurs when the partner signs off on it and there was a mistake. So let's see how this works. We come in, we finish the return, partner looks at it, looks at who all worked on the return and says, all right, this is one of our top staff members right there, one of our best new hires. We've got a good senior looking at it. We've got one of our top managers. They all said, this looks good. Partner's in a hurry. Assumes, you know, everyone's done good work in the past. They glance down quickly and say, all right, looks pretty good. I don't see anything glaringly obvious. And the detail work should have already been done by my, by my uh, manager and my senior. And so it looks good, right? Partner signs off on it, sends the return in. Well, now the IRS gets a hold of the return. IRS looks at it and goes, whoa, 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 lots of issues here, right? Well, at this point, this is an external failure because now the product has left the building. Now 
the return has been filed. So what's going to happen at this point is the IRS is going to look at the return. They're going to send in a letter to us. They're going to send in a thing. Um, they're going to send in basically an analysis of the tax return and say, all right, why did you not do X, Y, and Z? Why did you report this in this way? Why did you do such a bad job, essentially, right? Well, at this point, that probably is coming with a fine to our customer. So if you're the customer and you came and you paid a CPA firm a lot of money, presumably, to prepare this tax return for you, and it's not even prepared appropriately, how do you feel about that CPA firm? You probably don't feel very good. And because you don't feel very good about them, right? One, you're probably not doing business with them anymore. So we're probably going to lose your future business. But two, assuming this is bad enough, when someone asks you, hey, my taxes have gotten a little bit more complicated this year. I really need some help with them. You're going to do one of two things. You're either not going to recommend my firm at all, right? And you'll be nice and just not mention that we did a bad job for you. Or you might actually say, don't go to X because they did such a bad job on my return that I don't trust them and you should avoid them, right? Well, at that point, not only have I lost your future's business, but I'm losing future business from other people as well. So the damage to the reputation is tremendously quick. And especially now that we have social media. If I fail a customer badly enough, then I may get ripped apart on social media so badly that my company goes under in no time. And it could be as simple as I made one or two bad mistakes. Well, true, right? I did make mistakes, but people are human, right? People are going to make mistakes. You've got to figure out a way to fix it. But the idea is if we can avoid this external failure, we can do a lot better for ourselves and for our customers. So I think with the tax example, it's, it's pretty stark what's happening, but I think it might be even easier to understand, say, an auto example. So let's look at this real quickly then for, say, an auto manufacturer. So we have prevention. So this would be the training of our employees. So how do you install the airbag? How do you put on the tires? How do you do all of those things? Assuming that's done right, we'll have some type of appraisal that happens. Someone will come by and test airbags on a couple of them. Somebody will test the air pressure in the tires, make sure the engine is installed correctly, all the different stuff. At that point, we'll move on to internal failure. The car is fully put together, about to roll off the assembly line and someone notices, oh my goodness, there's X, Y, and Z totally wrong with this car. It has to go back and get redone, all right? Internal failure is that point. So is it a problem? Yes. Is it expensive? Yes. Is it better to catch it in-house than outside? Absolutely. So external failure, though, is when we have produced a product, it has rolled off the assembly line and sitting on the sales lot. We then sell the product to a customer, customer leaves, customer pulls out, gets in a really bad wreck, and the airbags don't go off, All right? The airbags don't go off, they weren't installed properly, and at this point, we have external failure. So this external failure is going to do a lot of stuff all at once. So one, and perhaps the most important, is we have hurt our customer right? They should have been protected by our airbags. They are not because we did not install the airbags properly. In that case, this is a huge external failure issue, but not just from a business side of say, saying, you know, well, you're probably not buying my product in the future. We're probably losing your future sales, but I have actually hurt you, right? You are actually in the hospital. You are actually with bodily injury. You are actually harmed because of my lack of due diligence. Now, the other thing that's probably about to happen is assuming this was produced poorly, there's probably about to be a lawsuit on my hands dealing with the fact that I have actually hurt or killed you or a family member because I did not install the airbags properly, right? And so this is an issue that we have to deal with. So external failure, it does happen, but it is by far the worst and the most expensive of these four product costs or of these four costs of quality. So as I said before, you can choose to pay now through prevention and training, through appraisal activities that are well done and well thought out, or you can pay later through internal and external failure. But the problem is, as you move down this list, that cost only goes up, right? If I had caught that airbag installation before I sold you the car, it would have been fixed. Now when you got in the wreck, 
no big deal, right? The airbags deploy, everyone's safe, everyone's okay, right? It's not ideal that there was a wreck, but you're in a good quality product that is actually protecting you. At that point, we've done all we can do as the company. But if I sell you a product that is defective, even worse, if I know it's defective, we're going to have a really large external failure on our hands that we just can't afford to have. So those are our costs of quality. Now, lean operations we've talked about a few times this semester. This is primarily dealing with things like just-in-time manufacturing. So here we see just-in-time inventory systems primarily used to reduce the cost of moving and storing inventory. So this is where we don't even start production on your order until it is actually ordered. So once I have an order in hand and payment in hand, presumably I will actually begin producing your order. Until that point, I am not lifting a finger, right? Just in time. Now, the idea here, of course, we want to try to minimize inventory carrying costs so that hopefully I can actually have a zero balance of inventory at all times. I get your order, I produce it, and then I hand it to you as you walk in. Right, but hopefully I don't have this big backlog of inventory that's costing me money. Now this works really well, sometimes. And sometimes, like say in 2020, 2021, when we're fighting a pandemic and supply lines get disrupted, this is not such a great way to do business. Because if you do have a problem with your supply line, you will not be able to meet customer demand. And if you cannot meet customer demand, then you are probably not only losing the current sale, but future sales from that customer as well. So we have to be very careful with that. Now, cellular manufacturing products are made by teams of employees in a small workstation called a cell. This is primarily, um, when I think of this, I tend to think of things like an assembly line, right? You have the same people putting the tires on every single car. You have the same person installing the engine on every single car. You have the same person doing the same work over and over or the same group of people doing the same work over and over. And this is because the more you do something, the better you get at it. The better you get at it, the faster you can do it, and the less errors you will make. So this turns into a really good situation for the company to try to cut costs and improve efficiency. Now, the one thing you do have to remember, though, is if you're going to run a just-in-time operation, you cannot afford those costs of poor quality. You just can't. If you have no inventory and you produce this wrong, there's no backup to sell your customer. You have to redo it. And if it's a just-in-time situation, you don't have time to redo it. So it has to be right and has to be right the first time. That means I would expect to see a very large investment in prevention costs, an almost equally large investment in appraisal costs, and I should see very few costs actually coming in through internal and external failure. Now, lean accounting, of course, um, eliminating waste, using alternative performance measures. So instead of just looking at things like, say, return on investment, net income, all those types of just purely financial metrics, I might be looking at things like the number of orders without defect. I might be looking at the number of orders that shipped on time or were delivered on time, because that would be the type of measurement system I would need if I was actually using a lean operation. Now, of course, we can see ABC for service providers. So I'm going to use the online education example because I think it is by far the most relevant um, at this time. So we'll be looking at the different activities involved in online education. So the first is to register a student. To take this course, you had to actually register. If you did not register, you would not be in the course. And so you have to actually, on an individual, on a unit basis, register for the course. Then you have the batch level items. For a batch level activity, this would be delivering the online course. Whether I have one course in my online class or a hundred students in my online class or a thousand, I teach it the same way. I assign the same amount of homework. I assign the same amount of exams. I assign the same lecture videos. I assign everything identically because truthfully, I'm delivering the course. Whether it's one person or a hundred, the only thing that changes is the amount of interaction with students, right? If I've got one student, sure, I'll talk to them a little bit more. If I have 100 students, I'll talk to each one a little bit less, but I'll still talk to them all as you come and talk to me. So the actual course delivery is the same. Now for the service level, right, this would be if I wanted to create a brand new course. So say there was an offering that we had never had before, I need to design a new course from scratch, or maybe a course I've never taught before. Well, I'm going to have to do a lot of work that time to get that built, to get that designed and set up. But once I have it built, 
I can pretty much recycle that usage over and over until either a major change in US GAAP occurs or there's some major industry shift or something that has to happen because the norm has changed. But by and large, the bulk of that course will hopefully be able to be reused as right? a service level activity. And of course, facility level is the university as a whole. So we use at our university desire to learn, it's D2L. And without that, a lot of what we do wouldn't be possible. So the maintenance of that is not done by me, it's actually done by the university. So it's a facility sustaining level activity. Now, the last thing here is this idea of customer profitability. So just like we can look at profitability for the company as a whole, I can actually run customer profitability reports where I see how am I being profitable with regard to this one company? Or am I losing money on those sales? Or am I making money on those sales? So the first thing here is companies, of course, should assess the profitability of each customer. And the way to do this is to create a profitability sheet for each. So in this case, we sold 10 go-karts. These are the standard go-karts to Six Flags. We earned a total of $12,000. We then see that the product costs associated with that was a total of $10,500 gives me a product profit margin of 1500. The next line here is less the customer service costs. I would imagine this is delivery of those go-karts. So we had to drive them 200 miles at the cost of 250 per mile for a total cost of $500. This gives us a customer profit margin then of $1,000. So we did actually make some money on this sale. Now with that, we have of course hit the end of chapter 17. So if you have any questions, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Come by my office, send me an email. I'm happy to work with you to help you understand. At the end of the day, though, I cannot be the only one wanting you to succeed. You have to want it just as much. So if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, please come by. Please talk to me. We'll get you caught up. Thank you. Have a great day. We'll see you all next time.